Father, we thank you, God, for just this time to open up your word. God, we ask that you would, by your gracious hand, give us eyes to see you, ears to hear you. God, a a heart to receive and a mind to understand. God, all that you speak to us this morning. May it not only enter into our ears and into our hearts, but God, I pray that by your spirit, it would be transformative. And God, that you would be glorified. And we ask this this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we began the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. And we understood that as we were going to move forward in this new season, that it was going to impact us not only individually, but this should impact us as a church. As we study not just his word, but we're going to study the church itself. Who is the church? What is God's design for the church? Um, We're going to look at the theme of sent. We believe that God's calling us to be sent, not to simply just to receive, but as the rhythm of heaven goes, as we receive, we also give. And so um, for us, it's a matter of letting God's word come into our hearts, do a work in us, but then allow that work to carry us out into the calling that Jesus has given to us. So in number one, he told us that we are to go and to preach the gospel. We are to go into the into Jerusalem, which is maybe our local area, our Judea, which is like our surrounding community. Go into Samaria, which might be like for us, like the county or the state, and then um, into the uttermost parts of the earth, as some translations say. That's an opportunity for us to get out to wherever God's calling us to go. But more importantly, guys, listen: where you are, that's where you're at. Right? Where you're at, that's who God's calling you. He's calling you to be a Christian in that place, in that time. So wherever you find yourself, you are sent. You are sent and you're commanded by the Lord for that purpose. The other side of this too to remember is um, as God has called us to go out, he says that before you can go out, you must assemble together and You're going to see that when that happens, there's a unique dynamic where God says that he's going to give us the power of his Holy Spirit upon us that we would go as he's sent us out to go to be what? To be witnesses. He didn't say to go witness. He said to be witnesses. So we talked last week about the testimony that each of us has where We were something and now we are in Christ. And whatever that something was before Christ, the Bible tells us we've been saved from the penalty of our sin in the past. We're saved in the present from the power that sin has over our lives. But we're also guaranteed the assurance that we are saved from the presence of sin when we enter into eternity into heaven with him. Having said those things and knowing those things, everywhere we go, we have the hope of Christ in us that makes us witnesses. So it's not like we have to come up with all the different doctrines of the church. We don't have to have all the answers. It was good enough for a man to stand before the Jewish council and say, you figure it out. I was blind and now I see, right? And so that testimony that God's given you is what we're going to um, use as we're sent out to convey the message of not only Christ, but of his death and his resurrection. And as we look last week, the power of God as he lives in us. Amen. So that being said, let's pick back up in our study in verse nine. We're going to read verses 9 through the end of the chapter this morning. Verses 9 through 11. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go in to heaven." And in my own little notes, I wrote, wow, the opportunity to stand there and to watch Jesus as he ascends into heaven. It must have been a beautiful thing. 
You know, there was this longing that the disciples had to be with Jesus. And it wasn't just the supernatural act of him ascending. Trust me, I get that. But there's something about every eye being captivated. Right? Just the thought of Jesus. I mean, if you think about it for us, it's something that compels us to go on. Right? It's the thought that someday, though we have not seen him, and yet we believe, Jesus says we are more blessed because there's going to come a day where our eyes will finally see him. Right? And, and everything we could possibly imagine about him is just going to be thrown to the side. And the reality of his majesty, the weight of his glory to be in his presence, it's going to be ours. And so when things are difficult, when things are tough, that's what we have to remember. That our eyes, even though we're not physically doing it, our our hearts and our minds, our eyes are fixed upon Jesus. Because he is our exceedingly great reward. Our eyes are fixed on Jesus because he's the hope that we have of eternal life. To be raised from our physical death. How we overcome it by his resurrection. And how we will live in his presence forevermore. I can see why these guys are standing there just gazing upon him. Now this time here, this is the time that officially ended his ministry here on earth and his first coming. So when he ascends into heaven, this is that time when that's it. His earthly ministry is over. His first coming was when he was born of the Virgin Mary. And he was received up into heaven. This concluded that time. Now the interesting thing was. Is that he said that the disciples would be witnesses to him. Witnesses of what? Well witnesses of his life. Of his death. Of his resurrection. And of the ascension. This also affirms Jesus' right place. Or uh, his place at the right hand of the father. And so what's great about this is that. As these guys are the witnesses to these things, as they write these things down, as they pass them on to us, we believe. And even though I wasn't there to see it, I see it because they saw it. And so I'm actually able to partake of those things myself. And the power of the Holy Spirit in me affirms that Jesus lived, that Jesus died, that he rose again, and that he ascended into heaven where he lives forevermore to make intercession for us. And what's great about this is that the fact that he is in heaven, the Bible tells us this, that he is seated at the right hand of the Father. But in Hebrews, the Bible also tells us that he is our great high priest. Well, listen, when did the priest sit down? When the work was done. Right? And so when Jesus cried out on the cross, it is finished. Him going into heaven and taking his seat at the right hand of the Father affirms that his ministry is finished. No more work is required for salvation other than what? Other than faith. And we're to be witnesses of that in our life. It says he was taken up and... Uh, a cloud received him out of their sight. So as Jesus is leaving at this time, this was a fulfillment of the word that he must go and that the Holy Spirit would come. You see, he tells us in John chapter 16, verse 7, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So, In their minds, having him there physically is a great thing. And Jesus, listen, he says that he goes to prepare a place for us. For what purpose? That where he is, we would be there with him. So even Jesus longs to be with us. But there was an advantage to him going away. What was that advantage? It was this. It was knowing that he could only do so much as a physical person here on this earth. Remember, he laid aside certain attributes of himself for a a, a temporary time that he might come and live as a human with the power of God's spirit upon him, working and doing all things. But how much greater the work will he be able to accomplish when he leaves? 
Because when he leaves, the Holy Spirit comes. And listen, the Holy Spirit is in us all. Everyone who has called upon the name of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, it tells us in Ephesians 1, has sealed you. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit. You are in Christ now. And so rather than him being one person doing many things, being filled in all of us can now accomplish all things. It is to our advantage. Because I don't know how the disciples must have done it. I would have been pretty selfish with Jesus' time. I would want to be around him all the time. I would have wanted, I would have wanted his attention all the time. Hey, let me talk to you about this. Let me ask you about this. Let me just hang with you. You know, I can see how sometimes these guys were bickering a little bit, right? Because they kind of all wanted to be with Jesus. So it's definitely to our advantage because Jesus can reach the whole world. But how's he going to do that? Guys, he does that through us. So when he sends us out to go and to preach the gospel, he says, first, you must be prepared. And how are we prepared? He says to go and to wait for the promise of of the Father, which is the Holy Spirit. But it says here now, a cloud received him. Now, are we talking about just like a, a puffy, nimbulous cloud that's up in the sky? No. Clouds in the Bible refer to what? They refer to the glory of God. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 through 11, it says this. It says, And it came to pass, when the priest came out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud. For the, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And so, what we saw was the glory of God receiving Jesus Christ. And what's interesting is that this was part of his first coming. And we know, and we're going to talk about it a little bit later on, but we know that he's coming again. And we know that when he comes again, he's going to come in like manner. Does that mean that when there's a cloudy day, that's a sign that Jesus is coming? <laughs> no. But when you see the glory of the Lord, you will not be able to deny it. And it says that every eye will see him at his coming. And the glory of God, the weight of who he is, is going to descend when he descends with it. That should give us such comfort. It should, it should really lift our hearts to know that there's a promise given to us that Jesus is coming back. That should be the kind of thing that makes our hearts expectant. That every day when you wake up, guess what guys? Today could be that day. Are you ready? Are you ready for that day? I hope so. <laughs> Because, you know, Jesus talked about the, the master returning. And there were going to be some servants who are ready for his return. And others are going to be caught off guard. I think it's a word for us. We have to be ready that when he comes, we're ready to be received by him. And then we see that there's these two men. These two men stood by them in white apparel. Now, there is some speculation among certain people that this could have been this or that. It just seems consistent with the word of God that these two men were angels. They were messengers. We believe that these guys were messengers. Um, reminding us at this time, these guys this. He says that Jesus left and he's someday going to return to earth. But then he, they asked this question. Why do you stand gazing up into heaven? In other words, what are you standing around for? What did Jesus command you to do? Why are you standing up there gazing? You know, when somebody takes off from, an, from a, uh, the airport, and I see it, people usually stand by the window and they wait for the plane. They see the plane going down the tax, you know, just motoring down the, the, uh, the runway there. And they see the plane take off and everybody's like, oh, they're watching it. And then they don't leave until they just can't see it anymore. You know? I kind of picture that this is... What that must have looked like, you know? They're just waiting. Uh, there's the cloud. Oh, cl oh, whoa. Where is he? He's... And they're just sitting there waiting, hoping that Jesus might pop back down. Hey, what's up, guys? No? <laughs> but they're just standing there, you know, waiting. And so God immediately sends two, two angels to di dispatch out to do what? Hey, guys, what did I tell you to do? Why are you standing there waiting? 
right? So he tells them, hey, let's get going. And that's great because this is what we see them do. Um, we see them get back to Jerusalem. But they mention that he's returning in the same way. So listen, he's not going to appear as some apparition. You know, there have been many cults and many different religious organizations that have tried to say that Jesus has already come back. That he was here, you know, in the spirit. You know, the Jehovah's Witnesses, I think it was like 1914, they, they believe that, that he had come back. Um, the Mormon Church believes that, you know, the, that there was an angel sent to the spirit of the Lord. And, you know, all these different things that are going on. Listen, Jesus left physically. Guess how he's going to come back, guys? He's going to come back physically. He's going to be visible and... He's going to be at the same location near the Mount of Olives. In Zechariah chapter 14 verse 4. It says this. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two. From east to west making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move towards the north. And half of it shall move towards the south. And last year when I was in Israel, I stood up on this place. Was it the place? I have no idea. Highly doubt it. But but I was in the vicinity of this place. And one of the things that I was looking at, I was I was out there on the east and I remember looking out towards a place where the temple would have been. And I remember just my heart thinking about this is going to be that place. And I stood and I just kind of did one of these circles, you know. And I was kind of high up and I stood up on this thing. People were freaking out because they thought I was going to fall, but whatever. Um, so I was looking around and everywhere I looked, I just remember thinking, Lord, it's going to be somewhere right in here. And I began to look up. And I'm thinking, Lord, you're coming back. Somewhere right here, Lord, you're going to come back. And I look at, the, I look at the, 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 the east gate and I see they have it all walled up. You know, the, the, the Muslims believe that Jesus is going to return. <laughs> but check this out. Here's, here's what part of their, their doctrines uh, s- similar to ours. But it's definitely not the same. And they, they believe that Jesus is going to come back. So they've walled up the east gate. Because they know that he's going to come back through the east gate. And they've placed this, um, this row of um, graves. So you see all these headstones and everything else. Because they say that a priest cannot defile himself by walking through this area. And I remember thinking to myself, are you crazy? Do you really think that that wall being walled up is going to stop the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Do you think the one who raises the dead is going to be stopped by your plot to put graves in front of him? And I remember thinking to myself, God, you're coming back. And so, um, we've got to be ready for that. I love what it says in, in Luke twenty one twenty seven. Jesus says this. He says, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And so guys, let your hearts just be lifted up today because Jesus is coming back. Now there's a couple different comings of Christ. The first time he came in a manger as a human. We also see that he's not going to come um, onto this earth. But during the rapture. This is a time where he's going to call us. To meet him up in the clouds. But it's not actually part of the second coming. And then the second coming. Every eye will behold him descending. At the end of the tribulation period. And this is when he's going to place his foot. There near the Mount of Olives. And there's going to be a great earthquake. And the land is going to be split. And the world will know. That he is Lord. So in Acts chapter 1 verses 12 through 14. It says, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the room where they were staying. James, Peter, John, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. These all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So first and foremost, the, we see here that the, the two men standing by said, what are you standing around for? And what do they do? It says they returned to Jerusalem. What does this speak of, guys? This speaks of obedience. They obeyed the command of the Lord at this time. 
That's great to know because last time they were told to meet Jesus in Galilee, uh, but they didn't. And Jesus had to send someone to remind them. In Mark 14, 28, Jesus said, but after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. And yet what happened? They all were kind of spread out, dispersed. Uh, Peter went fishing. I mean, they weren't doing what they should have been doing. They didn't remember what Jesus said and they weren't obedient to it. But yet, here we go. We see these guys. These guys here are um, heading back to Jerusalem. What does that speak of, guys? It speaks of growth. Listen, it's an important thing for us to remember. That God does not desire sacrifice. The sacrifice has already been made. Jesus is the sacrifice. What does he require of us? He requires obedience. He says, I desire obedience and not sacrifice. You see, that was King Saul's issue, right? He overstepped his bounds as king. He was not to uh, jump in and perform the priestly duties. And yet he sacrificed right there. And Samuel had to come and remind him, hey, listen, what are you doing? This is not for you to do. This is not a good thing. The Lord does not need your sacrifice. He just needs your obedience. That's what he told him in 1 Samuel 15, 22. And so... It's a good thing that these guys, they're getting it. They're starting to understand. I mean, if you think about it, why wouldn't they be obedient to him? They've already witnessed his life, the way that he lived it, the way he carried himself, the way that he served others. They were witnesses to his death. They were witnesses to his resurrection. And they just saw him ascend. Man, they have every possible amount of evidence that they could possibly need right for what for obedience you know the bible tells us that we walk by faith and not by sight sure does help though when we can see sometimes doesn't it and so as these guys see man their hearts are compelled by god's spirit by the testimony of jesus to be obedient to him that when he says to do something we that they should do it and if they're doing it guess what guys we should do it as well If we're calling on the name of the Lord, if we've made him our Lord and our Savior, as our Lord, we must be obedient to him, right? He's our Lord by choice. We also see that they continued um, in one accord here. So here's a list of all 11 of the apostles. Now we say 11 because we understand that Judas, we're going to see here in a few minutes, he was not part of that group that joined them. But the rest of them, the 11, guys, listen, they continue together in one accord. This speaks of unity. You know, Jesus unifies us. This is where we see them in a place of waiting for the promise of of the Father. They head back to Jerusalem. They stay gathered together. And they're waiting for that promise that the Father is going to give them the Holy Spirit. Now, what's interesting about this word, uh, this um, phrase, one accord, it's the Greek word used here. It's a compound word. And it's called uh, homothumadon, meaning um, unanimously, unanimously together. And what's great about it is when you see that it's a compound of two Greek words, you see the first part of the Greek word and second part, you can see when they're put together, they they imply something of action. So they're not just unanimous in what they're doing, they're of the same mind in what's to be done. And um, what's great is this, as we saw going through the book of Mark, um, That there were many times where these disciples seemed to be kind of competing with each other. Trying to get ahead of one another. What changed? It's this. Although the things about them were still the same. Simon still referred to as the zealot, right? Um, as As we realize these guys still kind of carry about some of the same attitudes. What's great for us is this. They had experienced Jesus Christ. There's something unique, guys, that happens in us. When we have that that connection with Jesus. And guys, that's why when we grow together on Sunday mornings, we grow in the word of God. And as Bill said earlier, where do we connect? We connect as the body of Christ in our home fellowship setting. That's where we sit together and we unpack God's word. We talk about how it applies to us individually, but also how it fits with us corporately. 
This is, this is what the church is all about, guys. As we study the church, we've got to stop and remember that we are all of different backgrounds. We're all of different um, upbringings. We're all different in different aspects of culture. But listen, every one of us in here who has called upon the name of the Lord have this in common. It's Jesus Christ. And because of that, we can be of one heart, of one mind, and one accord. This is what God's calling us to do. That's the thing, guys. Why? Because together in Christ, we're going to be able to accomplish great things, many things. Again, it's to our advantage that Jesus go away because we have the Holy Spirit with us, in us, and upon us to do what he's called us to do. So we have to remember, guys, listen, two is better than one. Two is going to be better than one. And that's why I love it says here, they continued in prayer and supplications. Um, so if the church is the vehicle by which the Lord will accomplish um, his will in this world, then praying in the power of the Holy Spirit is the fuel that accomplishes that thing. If God's going to use us as the body of Christ to be his witnesses, to go out and do the things that he told us to do, whether it's healings, um, all kinds of different things. Whatever that is, it must be by the power of God's spirit. And where do we get that? Guys, there's something just beautiful about us coming together and praying with the same heart, with the same mind, being of one cord, unanimous in one place, crying out for God to move. Jesus said, you know, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of you. And so when we gather together on Sunday nights, I'm going to say it, every single one of us that's hearing this should be there. Imagine, guys, imagine if all of us piled into this room and we just said, we're not going to worry about Bible studies. We're not going to worry about all these things. We're just going to seek the face of God. And I said this last week and I'm going to keep saying it. It's not what will God do. It's what won't he do. What won't God do for a people who are crying out to him? God just cannot resist faith, guys. He can't. He can't. And when we're crying out to him in faith, we should expect a result. If we're praying according to God's will, which if we are unified together and we are praying according to his word, praying according to the things that we know God is placing on our hearts, then we know we're going to be in the will of God because this is what he has for us. He tells us that this is what we're supposed to be doing. Peter Rack Wagner wrote this. He says, this combination of praise, worship, uh, with sincere prayer and supplication is an unbeatable formula for drawing near to God, opening ourselves to the fullness of the Holy Spirit, hearing the voice of the Father. Now I can count on every single one of you guys being there tonight at 530, right? Even if you can't be there, if it's 5.30, just stop and start praying. Because whether it's in that building or at your home, I believe that if we're unified by the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter where we're at, pray. Right? And God will do much. Acts 1, 15 through 20. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120. And said, men and brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem so that the, that field is called in their own language, Akel Dama, which that is field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one uh, live in it and let another take his office. So first we see Peter stood up here and he took the lead. Now guys, listen, 
This was a natural thing for Peter. It just seemed to be that when Jesus had called him, that Peter was kind of the one that was a spokesperson for the disciples. Not always a good thing, right? We saw him say some things where like, they're like, Peter, what are you doing? You know, I can just see the looks on their faces. But nonetheless, there was just this natural leadership ability that God had blessed Peter with. And so it was only natural for him to stand up and take that role among the disciples. There's nothing wrong with Peter, seeing Peter as a spiritual leader of the first group of, of the apostles. Because um, this was part of what the ministry that, cut, that Jesus had given him while he was with him on on earth. So many times Jesus sent out Peter to do certain things. We saw many times that he called Peter to his side. Sometimes I don't know if it was because he wanted him with him to keep an eye on him or if he wanted him there because he was just he just had that that natural leadership ability and Jesus wanted to train him up in that. But then Peter goes on to talk about the death of Judas. And see guys, here's the thing. Judas It's a very sad story, isn't it? It's a very sad story. But Judas, guys, he he didn't ruin God's plan. He fulfilled it. Because this guy had purposed in his heart long ago that he was all about money. He was all about stature. He was all about things that were not of the kingdom of God. And he made it very clear through his actions that he was opposed to all that Christ stood for. And what led to this betrayal? It was these things. It was this compromise in his heart. You see, people didn't see that about him. People looked around and they would have said, who are some of the the great guys? Who are some of the great uh, apostles of Jesus? People probably would have named him. He had this look about him. But as we see with King David, God did not choose him because of what he looked like on the outside. He chose him because of who he was on the inside. And we see that that this story ends tragically because, guys, listen, he never, ever fully received Christ. And I believe, guys, with all my heart that if he would have just repented at any point in time, Jesus would have forgiven him. But we saw that he went out, and we know from the other Gospels that he had gone out, and uh, what did he do? He hung himself. And this idea about his entrails busting open, I'm not going to get into all the gross details of it, but that's what happens. When a body sits there and just hangs in a position, it begins to decay, and ultimately... The body can't handle the weight of all the fluids building up. But how sad that that was his demise. That's the way things ended. And, And all for what, guys? For 30 pieces of silver. Man, that that's such a a a convicting statement. What are what are we compromising for a mere 30 pieces of silver? You know, words like this should cause us to stop and reflect. What, what are the compromises in my life? What have I, what have I allowed in my life, you know? Um, at the school that I teach at, we, we've been talking about, a lot about that lately, about compromise. And compromise, you know, when we compromise, it's never anything really big and blatant and in our face, is it? It's usually something small and seemingly insignificant. And most of us approach that compromise with, I can handle it. Guys, the moment that thought even enters in your heart, flee. Run as fast as you can from that thing. Because the truth is, is that the moment you believe you have it, that's when you failed. And everything else is an open door for everything else to flood in behind it. Satan doesn't need to burst down the door. He just needs to get his toe in. That's really how it works, guys. And so we need to stop and ask ourselves, is there something that we've compromised in? Something that we know that just does not sit well with us, that the Holy Spirit is just convicting us. And it, can, it, it doesn't have to be things that we think of, like, well, I, I'm not supposed to be watching this or I'm not supposed to be listening to that. It could be something as simple as, I'll read my Bible later. I'll pray later. 
could be something real simple like that because later turns into hours. Hours turns into days. Days sometimes turns into weeks. And before you know it, we're in this dry place where, man, we're just, we can't even function. Right? Because Rome was never conquered on one big military battle, was it? What happened? It decayed from the inside out a little bit at a time. And that's what's going to happen to us. This is what happened to Judas if we're not careful with just making sure that that not only are we in the word together, not only are we praying together, but guys, our lives matter to each other. If you don't have a, a group of people that are walking with you, encouraging you, building you up, if you don't have a group of people to hold you accountable with the things that you've let in, that you've let out, that you struggle with, you got to let them in and say, hey, listen, I need some accountability in this area of my life. I need some help getting through this. Because guys, listen, that's, that's the heart of the church towards one another. So if you're not plugged into a home fellowship as an example, then you're missing out on a body of believers that they just want to come alongside you and pour into your life as you pour into theirs. They, they want to be a part of, of encouraging you. In doing what God's called you to do. They want you to be part of their lives to encourage them in what God's called them to do. We need that together. And then he goes on to talk about how he's going to replace Judas. Because listen, it's in his his belief that this would be exactly what Jesus would want. He's like, Jesus chose 12 for a reason. So we're missing one. Let's choose another one. So verses 21 through 23. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed to Joseph, called Barsabas, who was named Justice and Matthias. So we have now here a new witness. Peter here is declaring that what should be done next is according to what the word of God says, not what they feel is right. Even though the Holy Spirit hadn't fallen, they still had guidance from his word. You know, what's great about this is this. The word says in Proverbs, in Proverbs sixteen thirty three, he says, let them cast the lots and let the Lord decide. So it wasn't like they were gambling. Oh, we're going to cast some lots. Hey, who's the lucky one today? No, listen. They believed that biblically speaking, according to what the word says, that they were going to do this thing and they were going to let the Lord decide who it was going to be. Now, some people, they have an issue with that. Listen, all I know is that it seemed right to them and to the Holy Spirit And they cast those lots and the Lord decided it was going to be Matthias. What does that say for us, guys? Because even when we don't feel the leading of the Holy Spirit in going in a direction or in doing something, we have God's word. People say, well, just the Spirit hasn't spoken that to me yet. Have you read the word of God? Because, guys, it's a lamp unto your feet and it's a light into your path. And even when you don't feel the Holy Spirit, you always have God's word right there at your fingertips. And and the great part about it is this, guys. Listen, you will never find the Holy Spirit speaking things contrary to the word of God. And and, and I've counseled people where they've told me, this is what we believe God's telling us. Have you read the word? Let me show you this right here. All I'm going to show you is what God's word has to say. And then I'm going to ask you to pray through that and ask the Lord to give you wisdom about what you believe the spirit speaking to you against what his word has to say. And then I want you to, to, to not cling on to your own truth, but cling to God's truth. And that's where we have to be at, guys, because many people say, well, I just just doesn't feel right to me. Have you ever been wrong about your feelings? Many times, right? We've been wrong many times. And that's why we have God's word. That's why we have the Holy Spirit in us. And guys, there's times when 
everything seems to be the right decision and we just have this check in our heart. You ever fought against that check and done it anyway? And then later on you're like, ah, what did I do? (laughs) So knowing God's word and having the Holy Spirit and just tuning your ear to listen to him through the word and through his spirit, we're going to do exactly what God calls us to do. That's what... That's what we see here. And so when Peter goes through this process, um, we believe that this was the right thing. So what was the main job of the new apostle? It was simply to become a witness with them. That's what they were calling for. They weren't calling for the guy who has the best ability out of all these guys. It wasn't about that. It was like, hey, which one of these guys has been with Jesus from the beginning? Which one of these guys is a witness to his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension? And it was these two guys. And so we see that we have the ability of um, the same thing. We can do the same job um, by showing Jesus lives in our lives as well. In 1 John 5, verse 10, this is what talks about being a witness It says this, John writes, he who believes in the son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he does not believe, he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his son. And so guys, listen, by being a witness, not witnessing, but by being a witness of that time when you were blind and now you see, you were deaf and now you hear, you were lame and now you walk, you were dead and now you're alive. You have that witness in yourself. And so in the same way that Matthias was chosen because of those things, you have been called. You have been chosen. I love that. I'm going to be teaching on it tonight in Jude 1. And he talks about being called, being sanctified by God the Father, being preserved in Jesus Christ. Man, our testimony is so valuable. Do you know it? Do you remember? Do you remember where you were? And do you remember what happened when you said yes? Your testimony, it's priceless. And we'll finish up now in verses 24 through 26. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two You have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias. And he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So first of all, and they prayed. Now listen, I'm not going to sit here and I'm like, well, I am going to keep emphasizing this point. I am. And they prayed. Ladies, did you see what the study for the women's study is all about? It's about what? It's about prayer. If we haven't figured out, guys, that prayer seems to be the key in all these things for our lives here on earth, they prayed. This shows us, guys how powerful this particular spiritual discipline is and all that it can accomplish. The more we pray, guys, the better we get at praying. Some say, I just have the hardest time praying. I get it. This is not a a physical battle you're facing, guys. Remember, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, do we? What do we wrestle against? Powers and principalities. It's a spiritual thing. In 2 Corinthians 10, how do we fight that? He says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. It's not a physical thing. But mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. It's praying in the spirit, guys. And they prayed. We're going to keep hitting this over and over again, guys. Because, listen, once they went through, and we, as we read through the Gospels, once they, once they went through the life of Jesus, what did they see Jesus doing? Jesus modeled this for them. In Luke chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, we see that these guys here in Acts are being obedient to the very thing that Jesus was doing. It says this, Now it came to pass in those days that he, meaning Jesus, went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he calls the disciples to himself, and from them he chose twelve from whom he also named apostles. 
And they prayed. They prayed and they chose. What were they doing? They were following the model of Jesus. Guys, if Jesus was in prayer, and this is God in human flesh, and he's praying, what about us? You think we should be a people of prayer? What is prayer? It's just talking to God, guys. It's being real with God. From everything, from prayer and worship, adoration, to just crying out and just letting God know what's in your heart and what you're dealing with. Read through Psalms sometimes, guys. You see the heart of David as he was constantly in a place of depression, constantly in a place of worry and fear and anxiety. But in all those things, what do you see coming back? He's always turning his heart to the Lord. These are models, guys, for us that we should be as they are. We see that the lot fell on Matthias. Now, guys, listen. Do we know much about Matthias? Outside of this, we really don't. There's a little bit of church tradition and history. But according to the word, this is really the last time that we hear of Matthias. Was he the right choice? I don't know. But the Bible records this as the decision. And guys, does the Lord make mistakes? No. How do I know this? Because he chose me. I don't know how to figure it out, but he chose me. And he chose you. And you're like, what? So we must know right then and there that it ain't about what we can do. It's not about our ability. It's about what? Our availability. Matthias, he was a witness. He stuck around. Right? Through all the hard times. It wasn't easy following Jesus around for three years. But yet, he stuck it out. He was, he was named as one who stuck it out. And guess what? He was chosen. Guys, you're chosen. If you've called on Jesus, you're chosen. You can stick it out. And, you know, by the way, out of that list of names that we talked about of the 11, how many of those guys are mentioned in the rest of Scripture? Let's see, Peter, James... Jude, John, but what about the rest of them? Are they all part of this big grand thing? Do you see letters written in the Bible from them? No. Does that mean that God made a mistake when he chose them? No. So it's okay that it fell on Matthias. Some people say, well, no, Paul was supposed to be, listen, I don't know. Figure that part out. All I know is that God doesn't make mistakes. And Paul even said of himself, it was at an appointed time that he was chosen. So... We'll see. We'll see how it works out. So what are we going to take away from the message? A couple things. And we're going to do this. We're going to do this on Sunday mornings. And we're going to do this on Thursday or Friday nights at the home fellowships. We're going to unpack these things together. And we're going to unpack them from these two perspectives. From individually and corporately as the church. So individually, first and foremost, we must be obedient to God through the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. James 1.22 says this, But be doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So we have to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. We have to be obedient to the Word of God. Second, we must be prayerful. In 1 Thessalonians 5.17, the Bible tells us, Pray without ceasing. Now, does that mean you don't have any other conversations? With anybody else and all you're doing is praying? No, it's not what he's saying. But in everything, let your life just be about a life of prayer. That when you have the opportunity to pray, you pray. When God puts something on your heart to pray, you pray. Also, again, say it again, you are that witness, right? You have that testimony. Go back, write out your testimony, guys. Write out your testimony and try to get it down to 30 seconds. Why 30 seconds? Because if you're standing there talking to somebody that you don't know, guess what you have? You got about 30 seconds of their time. And if you can bust out your testimony to them in about 30 seconds, you're going to plant that seed. And maybe it'll lead to more conversation. But think about your testimony. Write it out for yourself. It's good for you to stop and reflect and remember. Now, corporately... We must be willing to wait and 
We must be of one accord together. In Philippians chapter 2 verse 2, Paul says, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Also must be ready to pray together in the Spirit. Now listen, in Spurgeon's time, steam was the power source of the day. And boiler rooms were the powerhouses, the driving forces of everything from vast machines and factories to household heating systems. Boiler rooms, however, were not pleasant places to visit. They were functional, dirty, and hot, often tucked away in the basement. Likewise, Spurgeon saw the prayers of his people in the boiler room, as he called them, um, as the spiritual power behind his preaching and ministry. And so here's a quote from him. He says this. He says, Brethren, we shall never see much change for the better in our churches in general till the prayer meeting occupies a higher place in the esteem of Christians. Guys, again, I want to encourage you. Please come out. Remember, when you're not there, it's not the same. You matter. And when we're all together, one heart, one mind, one accord, and we're all praying in the Spirit, here's what I do know. That the things that I pray for, the Holy Spirit's going to move me to pray for. But He's not going to move me to pray for everything. And so when you're there, and you're praying in the Spirit, then the things that God wants to speak through you will build up and edify and encourage me. We must be a people unified together, and we must be a people of prayer. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word this morning. Jesus, we thank you for your example of your time here on earth. But Lord, we thank you for the example of the apostles. Lord, these disciples of yours, God, who walked where you walked, they heard what you said. But Lord, I thank you for their example of how they were obedient. And God, they began to live out your life. Rather, Lord, you began to live out your life through them. God, I ask for us this morning. God, for you to search our hearts. Lord, if there's any compromise, if there's any area maybe yet, Lord, we haven't yet surrendered to you. Lord, that you would be able to do everything you desire to do in us and through us. Lord, I pray that you would reveal that thing to us. God, that you would root that thing out. Lord, that God, you would set us free to be unified together in our hearts and in our minds. God, that in everything we say, Lord, would be of your spirit. Everything that we do, Father, would be according to your will. And Jesus, everything that is done would glorify you. And Lord, I want to just take this time right now, and guys, with all your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if if you're here today and you realized that maybe you've never surrendered your life to Christ, you've heard a lot about Jesus, but you've never asked him to come into your life, to be the Lord of your life, to be your Savior, to forgive you of your sin, to remove the nature of sin so that you would be now a child of God. If you've never done that, Today's that day. Why wait? Today's that day. Is there anyone here that needs to give their life to the Lord this morning? Just raise your hand. You don't have to do much. Just raise your hand and we're going to pray for you. Is there anyone here that wants to do that? Amen. Thank you, Lord. I see you back there. Thank you, Lord. Maybe it's been a while. Maybe you just realized that you're not that same on fire Christian that you used used to be, maybe that you once were. You know what? (laughs) Today, by the power of God's spirit, this is your chance to lift your hand and say, God, that's me. I need more of you. I want to be on fire for you. I want my life to be a testimony. And I want you to use my life in that testimony to preach the gospel to others. If that's you today and you need more of Jesus, just lift your hand. I want to pray for you as well. Amen. I see you guys. Anyone else? Amen. I see you back there. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Father, you see those hands, God, who 
They just came to that place, Lord, where they realized more than ever they need you. They need you to forgive their sin. They're proclaiming today that you are their savior. But Lord, they're also lifting their hand because they need you to be the Lord of their lives. They need you to lead them in all their decisions. They need you to guide them, God, in every endeavor that you take them to. Lord, they're surrendering their will for yours today. Lord, I thank you for your word that that assures us that when we pray and we call upon the name of the Lord, that we shall be saved. I thankful, Lord, for those people who gave their life to you today. And I thank you that your word tells us that whenever someone repents and turns to you, that all of heaven rejoices. Thank you, Lord, for this time. And Lord, I, I just lift up those, God, who need more of you today. God, they're declaring by faith, Lord, that it's you. It's not more of them, Lord, that they need. It's more of you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would honor that, God. As they lifted their hands, God, you've already begun to work. I pray that you would set their hearts and their minds free. I pray that they would lay down any weight or any sin that's easily ensnaring them. And, God, they would just choose to run this race with endurance today. Give them the strength to run for you. God, bless us, your people, the church. Help us, God, today to be more like you and less like us. God, that you would be exalted in our lives and in this community. Be glorified, we pray. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.